Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore. Today we are going to be talking about another Imperial Guard regiment, namely the Mordian Iron Guard. A rather infamous regiment who has a snazzy style of dress. The Iron Guard hail from the planet of Mordian, as their name might suggest. A rather unfortunate place to live, but not anywhere close to the worst place you could possibly live in the Imperium. It is a world that is tidally locked with its sun, which means that half of the planet is constantly bathed in lethal radiation and is utterly inimical to human life, while the other portion is bathed in eternal darkness, and it is on this side that the vast majority of the population lives. Now, there is no specific mention of this in the lore for the Mordian Iron Guard, however, we know of a similar planet where half of the planet is constantly submerged in darkness and one half constantly bathed in radiation. On that planet, only the wealthy nobility would have what is essentially retreats on the sunny side, where they would have radiation shielded houses and huts and mini communities for the ultra rich, where they could enjoy the sun, as it were. And it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to assume that Mordian would have something along the same lines, but these would of course be reserved only to the extremely rich, wealthy and the powerful. The remaining 99.9% .9 of the population have to live in exceedingly cramp and poor conditions on the night side of the world, where they are stacked one upon the other like sardines inside of massive hive cities. And to make matters even worse, Mordian is an exceedingly poor planet. There is very little in the way of natural resources located on the planet of Mordian. In all due likelihood, one of its primary exports would probably be energy, seeing as the sunny side of this particular planet would be the perfect spot for hardened solar farms and various radiation gathering devices. But this is nowhere near enough to make a planet wealthy, and any mineral resources that the planet might once have held have long since been depleted. As such, the planet is now living at the border of extreme poverty, at the point where it might even fall so far as to be considered a non-contributing planet to the Imperium. This is a state that is about as close to death as you get within the Imperium without actually being dead. It would essentially mean that the wider Imperium would cease and desist all aid to the planet. This means that Mordia would have to feed itself. It would have to clothe itself. It would have to produce all of the various resources it needs to live by itself, as practically all trade with the wider Imperium would cease. And considering the planet's impoverished state, it is highly unlikely that the planet would be able to provide the citizens with the basic necessities for living. Which, as you can probably imagine, would lead to just a tad bit of unrest on the planet. In all due likelihood, it would descend into full-scale anarchy and rioting within months. However, Mordia does have one resource that the Imperium is always desperate for, and that is solid and dependable fighting men and women. So as long as the Mordian Iron Guard retain their exemplary reputation, Mordia is unlikely to be thrown out into the cold, hard vacuum of space without the Imperium's protection. But what is the deal with this Iron Guard anyways? They just kind of look rather foppish, don't they? Dress uniforms on the battlefield? Ha! <laughs> How silly, will they? And while, yes, that is kind of true, the Iron Guard are slightly different than your average Imperial Guard regiment. And that has mostly to do, again, with their home planet. As previously mentioned, their home planet is somewhat poor. Somalia level poor. And what do you think happens when you have billions of people tightly packed together in confined spaces, all suffering through the exact same hardships, the lack of food, the lack of clean air, absolutely no access whatsoever to sunlight, and the water supply could at best be described to be erratic. And finally, for the cherry on top, the piece du resistance, 
they all have to live in hermetically sealed, void-proof shelters on a planet that can barely afford to run the base necessities of life, e.g. a steady supplies of food, air and water. Luxuries like, for example, air cooling is entirely out of the question, which means that your average Mordian hive is essentially one step away from being a massive easy-bake oven, with the people being the cookies. So, to summarize, you're hot, you haven't eaten for days, you haven't washed for weeks, you can barely find water for drinking, never mind actually cleaning, Something which is made considerably more egregious due to the fact that you live in a tiny ass hab complex with hundreds of thousands of equally filthy people stacked one atop the other in what could at best be described as inhumane conditions. And to be entirely honest, inhumane is far, far too charitable a term. Most planets, even within the rather cramped and confined borders of the Imperium, would consider treating cows in this manner to be cruel and unusual. And if you have to live like this, day in and day out for your entire life, you might eventually think to yourself, fuck it, I'm gonna start some shit. Because honestly, at that point, anything, anything whatsoever to get you out of the absolute miserable drudgery of everyday life might seem like a really fucking good idea. Here I'm standing, in the bread lines, again, and the food is late, again, and up on a massive picked screen in front of you, you see a hilariously fat member of the local nobility whine about how he could only afford to operate two villas on the sunny side of the planet. In such a situation, you might be excused for looking for some way to vent your frustration, and a good old-fashioned food riot might be just the answer you're looking for. Now imagine that very same scene playing out across tens of thousands of other locations across hundreds of hives involving billions upon billions of people. Powder keg is a severely lacking description for just how volatile this situation is. A more pertinent way to describe the situation might be to imagine a small glass vial filled with nitroglycerin, currently residing snugly inside the anus of a rabid ferret who has made its nest in the planet's primary nuclear defense missile stockpile. And then imagine a second ferret, equally rabid but slightly larger and bulkier, and ravenously horny. Now imagine aforementioned critter discovering the furry backside of his nitroglycerin-carrying competitor. And with that, you will have a fairly accurate idea of the situation in your average Morgian hive. As you can probably imagine, aforementioned example usually leads to a explosion. And usually that explosion will result in a considerably larger series of explosions. To attempt to halt this rather unfortunate series of event, Mordian requires a vast and exceedingly effective police force, and this is where the Mordian Iron Guard comes into the picture. While most hives prefer to regulate their citizens via the Adeptus Arbites or the local equivalent, Mordia has decided to skip the middleman altogether, and now keep control over their civilian masses with the military itself. Apparently, the local police forces simply wasn't effective enough. Because you see, the key to maintaining order in a situation that is in no way orderly, and imposing one's will upon an exceedingly unruly bunch of angry citizens, is to apply the correct amount of violence. Now, if your main problem is minor uprising of riotous civilians wandering through the streets with sticks and throwing bottles at people, that will easily be resolved by a large gathering of angry police officers armed with shock mauls and truncheons. In this particular scenario, the correct level of violence is a large number of injured civilians. 
The key phrase there being, injured civilians. You want them to live and tell their friends of the ass beating they received the last time they decided to step out of line. However, you do not form a firing line of shotgun wielding arbites and simply start target practice on their little civilian asses, because that will not go over particularly well with the other civilians. If you merely just beat the shit out of them, they will understand. They stepped out of line and therefore invited the beating. If you start just simply executing them, people might start thinking that that seems a little bit extreme, and might even get it inside their tiny little civilian minds to protest the excessive use of force. And now, you're going to have to use even more violence to correct the latest batch of individualist bastards. However, on the flip side of that very same coin, if you do not apply enough blunt force trauma to the civilian population, they might get it within their tiny little civilian minds to think, hmm, that last batch of rioters got off relatively easily. Perhaps I too should try my hand at rioting next time. On Mordia, the authorities have tried various level of stick to keep the civilian population in line. However, it has swiftly become apparent that the only way to keep the civilians relatively quiescent is to simply shoot the motherfuckers, because it turns out to be a relatively universal truth that a dead civilian is a thoroughly pacified civilian. And whilst in other Hive cities the resulting protest after having gunned down a bunch of unarmed civilians might prove problematic, the Hydran Guard will simply apply the exact same solution they used to solve the first problem. And after you have done this enough times, the civilian population will quickly realise that when the boys in blue show up, it's time to fuck off. Now, of course, I agree that this is not the gentlest or most nuanced approach to maintaining law and order I've ever seen, but it is undeniably effective, and the shock and awe value of this rather direct and blunt form of policing is enhanced by the fact that they look kick-ass while doing it. Imagine being out rioting on an evening, throwing one's bread bowl at various other civilian protesters and trying to tear down the officers responsible for feeding your ass. Now imagine a living phalanx of really, really hard-ass motherfuckers walking in perfect unison with bayonets twinkling and the twilight glow of the lumen globes, and all dressed up in perfectly ordered, spotless uniforms. Now imagine them assuming rank formations and leveling a veritable forest of lasguns in your direction. Trust me when I say that the overwhelming majority of people will rapidly and radically reassess their need to riot in the face of such an overwhelmingly blunt response. And it is this knack for pacification that makes the Iron Guard so very, very valuable to the Imperium's forces when they are on the offensive. After the Imperial Guard has conquered a planet, it is of course necessary to ensure that the planet remains conquered. And as it so happens, the local population often has certain issues which are frequently baffling and just downright silly. Like for example disagreeing with the Imperial authorities on the matters such as the complete and utter cancellation of any and all civil liberties, and general crushing of the population's spirits. But even the feistiest of planets will quickly quiet down after being assigned a regiment or two of Iron Guard. The local rabble rousers will either think better of their heinous plot to overthrow their rightful rulers, or they will rather quickly suffer from an acute case of lasgun burn. But of course, being glorified policemen is not the only thing that the Mordian Iron Guard are pretty goddamn good at. Naturally, to create such a police force, you need to drill them quite a bit, and you also need to make sure that they remain loyal. After all, this is a military force that will primarily be cracking down on civilian unrest. It is of course of paramount importance to make damn sure that the people sent in to quell the civilians do not themselves join the civilians. Therefore, their loyalty must be secured in no uncertain measures. Now, the ruling caste of Mordian is known as the Tetrarchs. They are the ones that control the entirety of the planet in a rather authoritarian manner. They ensure the loyalty of the Mordian Iron Guard by making sure that they get benefits that nobody else's does. 
In all due likelihood, a Moridian Iron Guardsman will receive considerable benefits that a civilian will not, and in return he becomes the embodiment of the state when it comes to maintaining order, which means undergoing an exceedingly strict regime of military training and discipline. As an example of one of the perks they are likely to receive, obviously you would not want your Iron Guardsmen to live down amongst the rabble. First and foremost, they might acquire a taste for the rabble's ideology, which would of course be rather counterproductive. Secondly, you would not want somebody that is known to be an Iron Guardsman to live in a neighborhood of civilians, since in all due likelihood, one or more of those civvies are going to know somebody who got brutalized by said Iron Guardsman's brethren. Thusly, in all due circumstances, Certainty, the Iron Guard will be billeted far higher up the spires, where the living is far easier and more comfortable. In all due likelihood, they will also be allowed to bring their families. This will put the Iron Guardsmen themselves on the hook, to put it rather bluntly. If any Iron Guardsman were to be found lacking, then in all due likelihood he would be thrown out of the fraternity, including of course his family as well. So any soldier that is part of the Moridian Iron Guard, in all due likelihood, has a family whose social status and current way of living is entirely reliant upon his status within the Iron Guard. And again, if somebody that was known to be in the Iron Guard and or his family would suddenly be expelled from said organization and forced to live amongst the peasants, well, let's just say that their life expectancy is remarkably short, even by 40k standards. And it is this very same strict discipline and unwavering faith in the command structure that allows the Iron Guard to be such a potent military force, because as I said, they are far from just a military police force. They have also distinguished themselves quite considerably on the field of battle. Their single greatest achievement was the defense of their homeworld, Mordian, against an invasion by Chaos Demons and Traitor Legionnaires. Unbeknownst to the Tetrarch rulers of Mordian, the ever-simmering discontent had grown into something considerably more dangerous. This was not some riot for food or possession, or clean air, water, or any of the normal amenities that allows a human to stay alive. This was something far more sinister. Deep down in the Underhives, a cult of chaos worshippers had slowly but surely began enacting a ritual, and nobody on Mordia managed to discover that this was in fact what was going on before it was way, way too late. In fact, the first thing that the Tetrarchs knew about the unfolding ritual was when the skies of Mordia burst into flames, as a huge jagged rift in reality tore itself into existence above the planet and began disgorging legions of demons and traitors onto the planet itself. This would in all due likelihood have been the end of most Imperial planets. When something like this happens, generally speaking you will be seeing mass desertions occurring in the PDF. People will simply be giving up hope, heading to home to defend their families, throwing down their weapons, or even turning to the cause of the great enemy. On Mordia, virtually none of the Iron Guard ever wavered in their dedication to protect their home planets. But of course, the dedication alone is not enough. Fortuitously for the Iron Guard, they also had discipline, training, and virtually every single Iron Guardsman was a veteran. Perhaps not necessarily of outright warfare, but he had certainly fought his fair share of battles throughout the Hive cities. Granted, what was descending upon their heads right now was considerably worse than any civilian rabble, but at the very least they had been tried and tested in combat-like situations, which meant that there was a far lesser chance that they would simply turn and run at the first sign of danger. Using this discipline and steadfastness, the Tetrarchs organized the Iron Guard into defensive cells scattered throughout their cities. Due to the rather sudden nature of the attack, no large-scale organized counterattack could be organized. Thusly, the best course of action for the Iron Guard would be to hold up in their fortified barracks and wait for further instructions. And believe you me, when we are talking about barracks, we are talking about virtual fortresses. After all, riots and large-scale civil unrest was not exactly a rare event, and thusly it would be natural for the main gathering points, the barracks and home areas of the Mordian Iron Guard, to be exceedingly heavily fortified to ensure that no random civilian mob could overrun the main strongpoints of these forces before they could organize into a coherent response. 
And whilst of course these fortifications would have been designed with civilian resistance in mind, they would still no doubt have access to heavily fortified debunkers and automated weapon systems. They might not be ideally suited for resisting a large-scale conventional military campaign, but they would undoubtedly be formidable enough to give any attacker pause, allowing the Iron Guard to mobilize and organize themselves, and then eventually attempt a breakout. Which was exactly what they did. After fully getting to grasp of the situation, the command and control structure of the Mordian Iron Guard decided that holding everything was, in all due essentiality, impossible. Demons, traitor legionaries, and millions of Chaos worshippers were quite literally raining down upon the city. They were under attack anywhere and everywhere at once. As such, the only reasonable thing to do would be to coalesce the Iron Guard into areas of strategic importance, and almost invariably, the areas deemed most strategically important were the holdings of the Tetrarchs themselves. And that might at first sound like a somewhat selfish maneuver, and well, yes, yes it was, obviously, but again, I remind you, Mordian was an exceedingly unstable planet, and any intelligent noble on such a planet will not be taking any chances with his own security. In all due likelihood, the Tetrarch's palaces would be virtual fortresses in their own right, fully equipped with barracks, fortifications, bunkers, and automated weapon systems. Thusly, it wasn't purely for their own self-defense, although, well, majoritively it probably was, but it also made sense from a military perspective. These areas would almost certainly be the most heavily fortified, and thusly, they would be the areas from which the Iron Guard could offer the most effective resistance. The fact that the overwhelming majority of the planet's population would be left to their own devices, well, collateral damage. And this, of course, would be another benefit of making sure that the friends, families, and loved ones of the Iron Guard would all be billeted in the same areas as the Tetrarchs. They would be falling back to defend their loved ones. The fact that 90% of the population was about to be messily devoured by demons, they probably wouldn't give that much of a shit about. After all, these are troops that have been specifically trained to beat down this very civilian population. In all due likelihood, the overwhelming majority of the Iron Guard would view the civilian population as little more than enemies, as the very same people who are throwing molotovs at them, shooting at them, throwing bricks at them, and who hate them. They would have absolutely no compunction whatsoever about abandoning them to the ravaging hordes. And especially not if falling back would mean that they would be able to defend their own families. And since the Iron Guard, supremely disciplined as they are, could now occupy defensive positions, they began taking an extremely heavy toll upon the invaders. Every single hab block was turned into a fortress, every single street was turned into a killing zone, and every single palace was now bristling with heavy weapons. Las cannons, auto guns, heavy bolters, and las guns in organized, disciplined ranks firing volley after volley of disciplined las fire into the invaders. And since the Iron Guard do not retreat unless specifically told to do so, every single solitary one of these strong points would have to be taken till the last defender. Every single hab block would have to be stormed room by room in the face of fierce opposition. Every single street would have to be stormed. Every single pillbox would have to be broken into and cleansed. Every single heavy weapons emplacement would have to be destroyed and every single guardsman would have to be killed. Mordian might be dying, but it was dying about as goddamn slow as it possibly could. Eventually, only the Tetrarch's main palace was left and its garrison of Iron Guard. They had been pushed back to this absolute last bastion that was currently brimming with weaponry. They easily repulsed an assault by traitor legionaries, which is no mean feat in and of itself, but having learned their lessons once, they sent in the cannon fodder next. Millions of practically unarmed Chaos followers were assaulting this one single strong point, throwing themselves against it for hours in an effort to either exhaust the defenders or simply cause them to run out of ammunition. 
but even this horde attack eventually petered out and failed. However, at this point, the Mordian Iron Guard was severely reduced. They had been pushed out of virtually all of their defensive fortifications and were now fighting on the steps of the palace itself. And smelling blood in the water, the chaotic forces initiated their final assault. Traitor legionaries mixed in with demons began one last hammer blow assault upon the last Tetrarch palace on Mordia. And just as this wave of violence was to wash over the last defenders, suddenly the skies above Mordia began to clear. The astropaths located in orbit above the planet had been trying to unravel the spell that had caused the rift in reality to appear in the first place. It had taken them days, if not weeks, but they had finally managed to unravel it. And with the closing of the rift, the demonic allies of the traitor legionaries and their chaos followers dissipated back into the ether leaving the traitor legionaries and their mortal followers to face the wrath of an entire planet, plus anything and everything that remains in orbit. Now, traitor legionaries are not stupid. They haven't lived this long fighting battles that they know they can't win, and so they immediately began to withdraw, pulling back to any and all void-capable craft that they had taken with them during the early stages of the invasion, or trying to steal anything and everything void-capable from the planet, leaving their mortal followers behind, hopefully, to slow down the pursuit of the Iron Guard. Mordian had done the impossible and resisted a full-scale demon invasion for long enough for the entire thing to collapse in on itself, a feat very, very few planets within the Imperium can boast of having equaled. And it was this act that truly launched the Iron Guard into fame and fortune. Imperial commanders not only across the segmentum, but in fact in different segmentums altogether, began clamoring for reinforcements in the form of Iron Guard regiments, as their discipline was quickly recognized to be a rather handy thing to have on the battlefield. It does, however, have a few drawbacks. While the Iron Guard can, generally speaking, be relied upon to fight until the last man and the last bullet, and hell, the last bayonet, this occasionally has a drawback. The Iron Guard is entirely reliant upon a functional command and control structure. They will not withdraw without orders. They will not assault without orders. Which means that if their command and control system gets somehow compromised, or indeed intercepted entirely, leaving the regiment without direct access to their superiors, they will simply carry out the last received order until they receive something else. Which means that a regiment of Iron Iron Guardsmen will quite happily stand in the way of overwhelming odds without retreating and die in a glorious last stand, when the overall campaign might have been much better served with their retreats. Additionally, while the Iron Guard is more than proficient in fighting in the style of a modern armies that are usually employed by the Imperial Guard in a loose skirmish formation where each individual squad will operate individually, again they are entirely reliant upon that command and control system. Individual squad leaders, or indeed platoon leaders, will not act without the direct orders of their superiors. This means that they are extremely inflexible and cannot take rapid decisions in the field, or, well, they probably could, they simply just won't. Which means that the Iron Guard is at a severe disadvantage if the combat situation is at all fluid, as they will simply not act upon their own initiative. This means that in more advanced and quote-unquote modern combat scenarios, you will be better served by practically any other guard regiment. However, if you need somebody to hold their ground against insurmountable odds, the Iron Guard are most definitively your regiment. And if you need somebody to fight against hordes of enemies, a la Tyranids or Orcs, that usually do not employ a great deal of battlefield finesse, again, the Iron Guard will do extremely well. Any situation in which they are allowed to regiment themselves as massive blocks of organized infantry, well within preferably shouting distance of their superiors, they will perform exquisitely. 
And in all due reality, the true strengths of the Mordian Iron Guard are best shown when they are not fighting as regular infantry. The Mordian Iron Guard of course comes in many flavours, as most Imperial Guard regiments do. They can be in the form of an armoured regiment, artillery regiments, super heavy tanks, specialised engineer regiments, heavy infantry, light infantry, although that is fairly rare, since light infantry usually require a certain degree of autonomy, since they are often expected to operate outside of the usual command and control structure, and of course good old fashioned line infantry. But whilst of course they are quite effective as your good old fashioned lion infantry, especially if employed against an enemy that they are allowed to line up in formation and fight against with Matt's disciplined volleys of lasgun fire, they work even better when it comes to operating heavy weaponry. Think about it. These troops are drilled and disciplined to a degree where a soldier will continue to carry out his given task until he literally collapses from exhaustion. This means that they are perfectly suited for heavy defensive regiments that need to operate heavy weapons, like artillery batteries. They are capable of maintaining a rate of fire that very, very few regiments can match, and they can do so for days on end. Same for heavy armoured companies. They can continue to carry out their duties in a tank crew, for example, almost beyond the limits of human endurance. The same also goes for super heavy regiments where the supremely disciplined and enduring crew can continue to operate the various systems on a bane blade, for example, at peak efficiency for far longer than most regiments, allowing super heavy vehicles to truly live up to their full potential without necessarily worrying about the constraints of their oh so fleshy crew members. And of course, their particular brand of discipline and dogged determination means that they are perfectly suited for the role of heavy shock troopers. Simply give them an objective and they will happily walk straight into heavy machine gun fire without batting an eye, until either the machine gun is destroyed or they are. Additionally, these non-line infantry roles has one considerable benefit. It allows the Mordians to be placed away from other Imperial Guard regiments. The average Iron Guardsman has a stick so far up his ass that he rivals your average Imperial Fist. And he values discipline and self-sacrifice above everything else. In other words, they are completely and utterly insufferable moral busybodies that are entirely convinced of their own superiority compared to any other Imperial Guard regiment in existence. Hell, they will barely and grudgingly admit that maybe the Adeptus Astartes could rival them when it comes to discipline and purity of purpose. This, unsurprisingly, tends to grate on the nerves of anyone placed nearby. In fact, I would absolutely love to see the situation that would occur if you put an Iron Guard regiment next to a regiment of Maccabian Janissaries. Both sides would be trying to beat the other one above the head with their chosen brand of morality. The Iron Guardsmen would be trying to instill within the Maccabian Janissaries the benefits of a strict moral disciplinary system, while the Maccabian Janissaries would be trying to beat the Iron Guardsmen over the head with the Book of Emperor bothering until they finally submitted that the God Emperor was correct in absolutely everything and that they should pray more often. Personally, I would imagine that at the very least small arms fire would be exchanged between the two forces within minutes of them talking to each other. And finally, let's go over their equipment. Your average Mordian Iron Guardsman is slightly better equipped than your average Imperial Guardsman, due to the fact that they are an elite force. They need to be. Their planet's resources are focused in the Iron Guardsmen, and they are their first and the last defense both against their own population and any nasty skulking little threats that might exist outside of their own gravity well. The first and best example of this increased standard of equipment is the Triplex Pattern Lasgun, the standard issue weapon of the Mordian Iron Guardsman. This is a considerably more advanced weapon than your average Imperial Lasgun, and comes with three firing modes. Single, triple burst, and fully automatic, along with a special energy setting. The normal Imperial Lasgun comes with three settings, light, medium, and fuck that thing in particular. 
The triplex pattern, however, goes one step further with the fuck that thing over there specifically right in the ass, which is a overcharge setting which essentially turns the lasgun into a mini version of the Imperial Long Lass firing specialized hotshot ammunition. This means that instead of simply leaving embarrassing scorch mark on your average traitor space marine, it might actually penetrate his armor. Granted, you'd still best aim for weak spots, but again, you've actually got a chance of penetrating Astarte's power armor. And when you fire it at a normal human, well, Whilst your standard issue Imperial Lasgun will leave a fist sized hole in your average human, the fuck em right in the ass setting will simply just vaporize his torso. There is, of course, a couple of rather severe drawbacks. The weapon is not designed to operate on this setting in any kind of extended period of time. It will severely reduce the lifetime expectancy of the weapon and the ammunition used in it. Worst case scenario, both the power pack and the weapon will be rendered inoperable, and worst worst case scenario, the power pack might simply just explode. It is, in other words, the kind of oh shit button that you would not give to anyone that did not have the discipline of the Mordian Iron Guard. After all, they can be trusted to only use the fuck em in the ass setting when it is absolutely necessary. And in all due likelihood, even when it is absolutely necessary, they're gonna have to be ordered to do so. But of course, even the finest weapon in the galaxy is of little use without some actual ammunition. The Mordian Iron Guardsman carries two charge packs, and unlike most veteran soldiers, he is likely to carry just two charge packs, unless specifically ordered to bring more. In the unlikely scenario that the Iron Guard officers have misjudged the amount of ammunition they require, each Guardsman is also equipped with a Mordian Pattern Combat Knife. This is less of a knife and more of a sword. In fact, it would probably be correct to refer to it as a sword bayonet. This means that it is a fair bit larger than your average knife, and thusly can be used both for slashing and stabbing in close quarters combat. And speaking of good old fashioned CQC, the Iron Guardsman is also enhanced with a surgically implanted injector system with five doses of combat stims. These will allow the Iron Guardsman to continue fighting despite injury and exhaustion for a considerable amount of time. Of course, utilizing all five charges is going to have a rather severe effect on his system when he finally gets off the stim high, and he's going to be feeling one f fuck of a hangover, but at least, in all due likelihood, he will still be alive to feel said hangover. And finally on the weapon front, the Iron Guardsmen are not usually equipped with grenades. They may be issued grenades by a superior officer, however normally they do not carry crack nor frag grenades of any sort. And the reason, of course, is that that kind of weapon usually requires some kind of personal initiative on when you are supposed to be throwing your explosive device. And the Mordian Iron Guard view personal initiative kinda like the bubonic plague, with hatred, disdain, and not a small amount of disgust. When it comes to personal protection in the form of a body armor, the Iron Guard are a little bit unique because of course they enter into battle in full dress uniform. However, that does not mean that they are entirely unarmored. In fact, those pretty little dress uniforms are flak vests with the entirety of the uniform consisting of layers of ablative and impact absorbent materials which provides roughly the same armor protection as your standard issue flak vest. Which actually means that despite their pretty little looks, the Iron Guardsman is better protected than most Imperial soldiers. And finally, of course, we come to the necessities. A rucksack, poor weather gear, anointed maintenance toolkit, a mess kit and water canteen, two weeks of rations, a blanket, a sleeping bag, a rechargeable lamp pack, a grooming kit, very, very important as far as the Iron Guard are concerned, dog tags, a copy of the Imperial Infantryman's uplifting toilet paper, and of course a dress uniform cleaning kit. Because, well, duh. After all, the minor inconvenience that you find yourself in a life or death struggle against the enemies of humanity is no excuse to not keep your uniform properly pressed and cleaned.
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Morgian Iron Guard. I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.